and welcome to this episode of the LSU Professional Sales Institute Podcast. My name is Greg Accardo, and I am your host. My day job is serving as the director of the LSU Professional Sales Institute. And as such, we're coming to you today from the E.J. Orso College of Business, located right here on the campus of Louisiana State University. I first want to thank all of our corporate partners who make our work here possible. They are United Rentals, BXS Insurance, the risk and insurance professionals for your team, CMA Technology Solutions, and Orso Insurance and Financial Services. So our guest today is going to be Tim Tim Riefler. So Tim is uh, kind of a unique guy. He's he's very sharp. He's impressed me a lot in his few presentations that I've seen. So Tim, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a bio. He is the chief visionary for Decision Labs. He is the chief strategy officer also for Corporate Visions. So Tim's got a great book out right now that uh, I'm, I'm in the midst of reading. It's called The Expansion Sale, which has got a lot of interest for us because it, a, lot of, a lot of the focus is on customer success management. And we're seeing that now as a growing field that's emerging in the world of sales. And I think Tim has got some really great insights that you're going to enjoy. So we're happy to have have everyone back today on this episode of the Talking Sales Podcast. And uh, really, it's great to have a really exciting guest today, Tim Reister. Uh, Tim was recently a guest speaker at a conference that I was part of. And very seldom, well, not very seldom, but, you know, when I hear a guest speaker who's really intriguing, it makes me think. Uh, and, and then they have a book. I'm like, wow, I got to get that book and find out more. So I uh, reached out to Tim and Tim, hey, welcome for coming aboard today. And thank you for uh, being part of the LSU Professional Sales Institute Talking Sales Podcast. Hey, thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. And I'm glad I said something stimulating or interesting to get me to this esteemed position. So good to be here. I think you pushed the right buttons. So, well, <laughs> I'm a little curious about your background. So tell us about, you know, what led you to becoming and, and you know, the chief strategy officer of corporate visions and the chief visionary of B2B Decision Labs, and explain that chief visionary title. <laughs> well, that's, when you get old enough, you can give yourself titles, but uh, so without taking too long, I I was a journalism major, uh, and I, I, I was pretty sure I was going to be the press secretary to the president of the United States, and then James Brady got shot, and I was like, that's a dangerous job, so I should go into sales. <laughs> um, so pu journalism, public relations, sales, it all went together. But I got, I got hired to do ride-alongs with salespeople. My first job was a corporate journalist, uh, a division of GE, and I rode along with salespeople to customers, and I interviewed them for success stories. And I started to really realize that customers live in a different story than the company lives in. The company wanted me to talk about the algorithms and the features of their MRI machines. And customers wanted to talk about their mission and patient outcomes and things like that. And I started an entire journey on this idea that customers live in a story that's different than our companies live in. And salespeople have to bridge that gap. So I got really fascinated with the idea of salespeople with their lips moving and how they're trying to broker the world of the company story with the customer story. And, and how can we help them do that better versus putting them in this unenviable position of trying to bridge that gap on their own. So it was, it's been a fascinating journey ever since starting out, riding along with salespeople, interviewing customers, and it's led to this moment where now uh, we are an organization that does research on the conversations that salespeople have with customers and then turn that research into practical training and skills development so that you have more effective customer conversations. You know, your background coming from the area of journalism, you know, I, I, you don't often see people with, you know, that, that credential background in journalism being in sales, but, but I can kind of see the connection a little bit. Maybe you, you can elaborate on this, that you're part of your, your focus and, and what you're trying to learn more about in research is about conversations. Could you talk a little bit about how that those two connect? 
Well, I, I'm I'm real biased towards a, a, a journalism background. One, it makes you're curious, right? You you just naturally ask questions, and that's what good sellers do too. And they don't just ask surface questions; they keep probing to get a little bit deeper. But then you're also a natural storyteller. You 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 then figure out how to tell something in a way that attracts attention and and gets people involved in the story and carries them through to a logical conclusion. In fact, many journalists write things so that you are are moved in a way to maybe do something different than you thought you should do or think differently. And so there's so many ways that I can now retroactively see the journalism background working for salespeople. Uh, but I think, yeah, you, you've sort of locked into that. It's not a bad skill set to have for all the reasons that typically make sellers successful. You know, would you consider that maybe a soft skill that this, this ability or this talent that you could develop to have more engaging conversations with a prospect? Yeah, I, I think like soft skills uh, get a bad rap because they're called soft um, you know, so sometimes we teach the hard skill of how do you run a process and how do you um, um, how do you complete this hierarchy or document of all the decision makers and how do you determine where you are in the pipeline and and then we forget the soft skills of the kinds of conversations you need to have the stories you need to be able to tell how to be engaging and how to be persuasive and uh, and I don't think of those as soft I think of those as the things that actually separate high performing sellers from low performing sellers. The, the real thing that separates people is not your ability to run a process, but it's your ability to articulate value. And that's all wrapped up in the things I said, being able to discover the right things, connect the right dots and then tell the right story. So I always say, when I look at companies and I say, there's always high performers and low performers, they're selling the same product. They've got the same pricing. They're running the same process. They're using the same tech stack. Why is there still a high and a low performer? And I really net it out to the ability or inability to articulate value. You know, if you go back, um, I'm just thinking back here to spin selling. Okay. I think 1988, uh, you know, the book came out, right. And, and we're still kind of in a way using spin as kind of that, that blueprint. I guess you could say it's a blueprint for a conversation. Yeah, the thing that's um, it's interesting, SPIN is a series of questions, right? Each one mm -hmm. of those letters, S-P-I-N, is a series of questions. What we have discovered is over the last, that's like 30 or 40 years now, uh, sheesh, um, that, that customers are getting a little bit tired of just being asked questions. Mm -hmm. the, so in theory, the idea is right, that you have to help a customer possibly discover needs they didn't even know they had and help see the, the threat, the, the problem, the missed opportunity in a way they hadn't framed it before. Um, but we're finding the evolution of spin where it isn't question first, um, it's now data and insight first and then question. And so there's still truth to the idea that you need to navigate people through a self sort of realization that they've got a bigger problem than they thought, a problem that needs to be solved. It needs to be solved with some urgency and that you, because you help them find this, are the obvious choice. Um, but we are discovering that you can over question people. So maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those research insights that we've discovered. Yeah, and and maybe I mean I'm 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 just thinking here out loud that you know, spin was written in 1988. That 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 was an analog economy. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and and now we've moved more of a, of a digital base where the you, you've got content, information. Customers are more educated than ever about what you sell, about their industry. Uh, they're looking for solutions. So you maybe you've got a point there that the old style spin, yeah, you know, people just don't need that because they already know. I mean, I'm, they're looking for maybe a little bit quicker responses or maybe more engaging conversations. Well, what I'll tell you what hasn't changed, but that's all true, is still everybody is still very voyeuristic. <laughs> and so maybe what they're saying is, don't just ask me questions so that I can help you sell me. They're saying, tell me something I don't know about a problem or missed opportunity I didn't know they, that, that I had. And the reason they're asking you as a seller to bring that to them is because you as a seller actually see more people who look like them than they do. 
you have to see your customers being sort of myopically focused on their own company, their own problems, their own politics. And they're just sort of heads down, just trying to keep it together. And then when you show up, that's the opportunity for them to pull their head up and take a look around and say, what am I maybe missing out there? What's going on out there? How do I compare to what's going on out there? Don't ask me what's going on here. I'm, I'm in that all day. The thing I, the, and the thing that, that could really hurt me is the thing I don't know, the thing I'm missing, the thing that others have figured out while I'm just myopically parochially focused on my business. So that's where it's changed. Just asking them questions will not elicit pains or problems that are big enough to get them to change. There's just the human psychology is we don't, we don't actually divulge problems that are big enough to get us to change. We just satisfy the request to give you some answers. But as humans, we're just so locked into our status quo bias that we almost can't give a big enough problem or pain point. You have to, you have to introduce that larger problem or pain point, the one that's big enough to get people to think they need to change. Would you consider that to be the biggest change in the business landscape in the years that you've been involved in this business? Yeah, I've been in the business long enough where the first big change was, hey, talk about benefits, not features. You know, now some companies still struggle with that. Mm -hmm. But the the thing that um that that I've seen is that um the flip from the customer giving you the insight on them to sell them to you bringing the insight to convince them they need to change or do something different. Um, because to your point, Greg, they, that with the internet and all the digital access, they know your product, your website's more up to date than you are. You know, you literally can't learn your products in, in as complete a fashion and as current a fashion as your website. So they can always find better information on the things they used to have to ask you for. Um, so the thing they can't necessarily find because of their busyness is what others are doing or like them are doing and how they compare and how you can help them see needs or missed opportunities. That just, that's the one remaining area that you can add value in. That's a great point. I'd like to a little focus now on your book, the expansion sale. Um, from, from what I can tell, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm fixing to read it. Uh, it seems like you, you, you have the, this, this really great focus on maximizing business growth from existing customers. Um, what are you finding in this area now? I mean, the book's been out a little over a year now. Um, so talk about the book and what are you finding now that the book has been out for almost 18 months or so? Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there's sort of three things I could talk about there. Why, why we ended up writing the book and, and then what, what we've sort of um, concluded in the book and then what we're finding since we delivered the book. So we did three years of research leading up to the book because um, what we've seen is most selling and most sales processes were formed on acquisition and around acquisition and winning new business and taking new logos and grabbing competitive share. And it had a certain tone and a certain approach. As more companies were moving from transactional sales to subscription sales, and more companies were becoming software as a service or anything as a service, and they had to renew customers, and they had to land and then expand customers through upsell and cross-sell, and they had to migrate customers. All things that didn't happen when you like sold them a John Deere tractor in the past or an MRI machine, right? So it's just a different dynamic where the seller and the buyer are in this longer relationship, this, this dance, this choreography, where most companies we deal with now, 80% of their number every year is just keeping and expanding existing accounts. Only 20% of most companies' number is the new logo. And so if there's something you have to do different to expand a customer versus to acquire a customer, then everybody should know about that. So we spent three years doing research on renewals and how to ensure renewal, price increases, how to communicate those without churn, apologies, how to apologize well to get people to be lo remain loyal or even more loyal after a service problem, and then how to effectively upsell and cross-sell. So those are the four studies in the book and the four practical frameworks in the book. We like to call those the, the acute commercial moments in an existing customer relationship, hence the expansion sale. And uh, so we documented all that and put it in the book. Well, now that the book's been out, we've been doing consulting and training around those frameworks. And what we found out is that the studies we did with professors like yourself, people out there running academically rigorous studies in each of those areas is, is that it's 
the expansion sale is 180 degrees different from the acquisition sale because the existing customer lives in a different psychology. I already decided on you. We're already partners. And the question I have for you is why should I stick with you and why should I do more with you? Versus the prospect who's going, I decided on somebody else. I'm doing this a different way. Why should I even consider changing and doing something different? And why should I do it now? Two totally different psychologies, 180 degrees from each other. One, you must disrupt and defeat the status quo bias to win and take the business from the incumbent. The other, you are the incumbent and you wanna reinforce and expand the status quo bias because you are the status quo bias. And it seems so obvious now that those would be two totally different paths requiring an understanding of the different psychology and then your stories and your skills must change to be effective in each of those two scenarios. You know, if, if you go back and look at sales training and sales education for that matter, you know, it's, it's for a long time, you know, sales, sales education has probably been around for you know, 25 years, you know, it kind of got started back in the nineties and really started growing. Uh, I think when I came on board here at LSU in 2014, there were only 60 schools uh, that had recognized academic programs. Now we're like 160. Okay. So that's a lot of growth. But if you look at the dynamics around the structure of that, it, it was it was all mostly geared toward the kill it and eat it mentality. Um, yeah. But now we're, we're seeing it, and maybe this is it, this is sort of a reflection of you know digitalization, COVID, uh, you know customers just you know having different needs. But but we're, we're we're now realizing now that we need to start evolving. It's not just to kill it and eat it. Maybe capture it, nurture it, grow it. Okay. So maybe, you know, there's some things for us as academics and practitioners that we need to refocus because the customers are not buying the old ways anymore. And I think your book is probably pointing a lot of this out. Well, yeah. And again, we didn't invent it. We just recognized the changes to the business models of most of the companies out there that um, they were going to be okay with subscription-based um, business models and revenue streams, but that just created greater pressure on ensuring customers' adoption, usage, success, and therefore the next and the, 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 the expand part of land and expand. It just always sort of was there, but now it's the business model. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think what we have to do is revisit the, the, the approach that was maybe born in a traditional discrete buy, transactional buy, pay for it all now and screw it in and, and, and set it and forget it, right? To now, like every, every day brings another opportunity for your customer to rethink that decision. They don't have to live with it. They don't just put it on the shelf. They can just turn it off. And, and that's anything from um, professional services and managed services to software and technology to any big equipment anymore is, is often just uh, sold in a way that is, is a subscribable model as opposed to a discrete transactional buy. And as a result, customer success is the new selling as opposed to acquisition and, 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 and taking out the competition is the selling. That's still a part of it, but it's a fraction. Well, maybe we should rethink the old sales funnel and sales convergence. Well, we're, we're seeing like two funnels now. Um, it's, it's, it's the acquisition funnel and the expansion funnel. And it's good to think of them as two different funnels. I've seen some of them look like a bow tie instead of a funnel. So imagine one big and shrinking to the deal and then, and then small to bigger as you expand that relationship. And, and again, like I said, it's a different psychology, different stories and different skills for the two funnels. And I think that uh, one, we should think of two funnels. Two, we should think of the psychology that changes between acquisition and expansion. And three, we got to think about how to equip sellers to participate differently and engage differently in those two funnels. You know, one thing that we're we're really interested in here at LSU, and I think I mentioned earlier, we have some colleagues here that are doing research in this area, is the area of customer success management. Um, It's a new and emerging field of sales research. Uh, Where would you like to see this path lead? Yeah, I, 
it came out of nowhere. I got to be honest, like it is a fast growing job title in the sales arena. Um, it's an interesting. They initially didn't think of themselves as being commercial people, customer success people were, I ensure adoption and usage and support and service. I drive NPS scores. And then we just let the commercial take care of themselves. Well, customer success is becoming a much more commercial enterprise. And like I said, what, what, what people are telling us, like some of our clients on the sales side is we should just start calling sales customer success. Because after all, isn't that what we're trying? That's our main aim is to ensure the customer does better tomorrow than they did the day before by choosing us and sticking with us. And I'm like, you know, that's a platitude, but it's not bad to think of it that way, that if I'm going into the world of selling, I'm really in the business of customer success. Well, if that's like, if that's the commercial, the pivot, then yeah, research has got to grow in this area because uh, I'm, I'm seeing reasonable research in the area of how to manage a good customer relationship through customer success, but how to how the commercial relationship in a customer success mindset changes, I think is sort of that new, that new vein that's going to be exciting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, one of our colleagues here, you know, explained it pretty, pretty clearly. He said, you know, this is going to be the new model. And, you know, we're going to look back and go, you know, where was this born from and, and what, what instituted it? And we're going it, to, it's going to cause us to rethink our whole education model. So we're now going to have to probably move away a little bit from that old school, you know, hunter mentality. And we're going to be looking, you know, at this new area and we're seeing it now in our corporate partners that they're developing these teams of success managers and they're hiring right out of education programs like ours, new new students coming out, graduating from LSU to take these roles. Now they're running through a, a short, you know, six month training program, but they're not going in the field to do sales. They're going right into the area of managing existing accounts. Yeah. Again, if 80% of your business comes from existing accounts, it's kind of where the action is going to be. And if, um, if I'm smart and I, I want to make that both a customer success and commercial moment, I'm going to be taking and bringing in some sales talent who then also has that, that customer success sort of mindset or framework. I, I think the thing that they're finding is traditionally the people who took customer success jobs were the ones who disdained sales. Uh, you don't catch me doing that. Well, I, it, that's not acceptable anymore. That's not an acceptable answer. Customer success is the reselling, uh, the continual reselling and upselling of a customer. So uh, yeah, I think your programs are going to have to adjust accordingly. And I think your students are going to find that there's maybe more growth and opportunities there than in the traditional seller environment. Ironically, because the field sales environment is also going inside and it's changing the whole dynamic, the digital selling relationships, changing the dynamic that uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these morph into one and then how the seller can sort of bifurcate their brain saying, okay, this morning on this call, I'm a disruptor and defeater of status quo bias because I'm acquiring a new logo. But this afternoon, I got three calls where I'm the reinforcer and expander of status quo bias because I'm trying to expand my existing relationships. So we think there's going to have to be a little bit of situational fluency where people can adapt literally call to call to which of those moments they're in. Wow. And, you know, if you look back at the impact of COVID and what it did to sales operations, um, you know, that was, that was pretty impactful. I mean, even in this area. Well, and, and the question is how permanent is it? And here's, here's what I, I go to. It's like, well, it may not matter what we as sales operations think we should do next. The buyer's going to tell us what we're going to do next. They're going to be like, yeah, I know you want to come back out and meet with us, but we're like, eh, you know what we discovered during COVID is digital interactions are just fine. Like the surveys that we're seeing from McKinsey and others where people were like, either I'm going to self-serve digitally or I'm going to meet with my salesperson face-to-face. -face. Now they're like, no, nah, digital interactions with salespeople are just fine. I just didn't think it would be, but now I discovered it was. So even as badly as people want to maybe take their sales operations back to face-to-face, -to -face, McKinsey's saying that 70 plus percent are saying digital interactions as the entire sales cycle are just as good, if not better, than face to face, so this is this is throwing everybody's sense of um, what a what a sales 
process looks like into a tizzy. And I, my famous, famous, it's not famous. I'm going to make it famous right now. Uh, my favorite statement is that salespeople of the future will be on a cadence, not on an expense account. That there's going to be a much more sort of automated sense of what touches and when and what should go into those touches that the technology will serve up to you in the morning saying, you've got eight of these types of touches. You've got 10 of these today because here's where you are. And now here's some suggested messaging. Here's some suggested content, maybe some, some prompting for presentation. Um, and you're going to go, yeah, I'm going to execute against that and bring the value I can bring to that. Um, but I no longer have to administer my process. My process will be automated. So um, now I can concentrate on the engagement part. So it's, it's going to be interesting. So um, as all selling moves to inside selling, uh, those their sales operations is going to have to refine the way they think about how they equip and enable the right sales conversation. You know, I had to write down that quote, cadence, not an expense account. Yeah. On a cadence, <laughs> not on an expense account. There you go. Make uh, it famous a, for me, Greg. <laughs> I am. I'm going to, I'm actually going to share this. So thank you for bringing that up. I want to swing back to the book ju just for a second. So, you know, you talk about in the book sales conversations, which, which I, I'm really interested in. How important is it today for sales professionals to train and practice the art? And I'm going to call it an art. It could be a skill, but it's an art of having great sales conversations. Yeah, I think what turns it from an art to a skill is the science like we study. Like we understand there's a different conversation for acquisition to defeat status quo versus expansion where you reinforce status quo. So once you start learning the science of the buyer and how they frame value and make choices, you can affect your conversation accordingly. But I saw this interesting study, and, and this, is, this is relevant, um, on online poker. So they looked at 103 million hands of online poker. And what they discovered when they looked at the analytics of online poker playing is only 12% of the time did the best hand win. Now, I don't play poker. I would assume I would want the best hand to give me better odds, but apparently it's not true. 88% of the time, the best player wins. And I think of that as a salesperson, we wanna have the best products, we wanna have the best services, we concern ourselves greatly with whether or not we have the right features and how that compares to our competitors. And we wring our hands if we don't think we have enough innovation. And the reality is when it's all said and done, it's not the best hand or the best product that wins, it's the best player. And I would argue that that is you with your lips moving as a seller, that that's where it, it, it's, it's understanding the psychology, the story and the skills to deliver a great sales conversation that will outplay the best hand. Now, if you have the best hand on top of it and you're and, and that good for you, that's always goodness, but it doesn't guarantee the win. So I think I think of sales conversations that way is it is a skill, just like actually poker is a game of skill. Sales and poker are not luck. What's the best way for salespeople today to learn this skill? Well, um, I've actually got four books out there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, plug the uh, books. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Conversations that win the complex sale, and then the three value conversations, and then finally the expansion sale are the three most recent. And 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 really it's I think of salespeople, you have to think of yourselves as like change agents and the psychology of change management, because you're changing people's minds and you're one part psychologist. Again, you're not a product expert as much anymore. That is what it is. Now your, your job is to shape the way people frame value and help them make choices, facilitating value and facilitating choices. And so anything you can find on, on the psychology of decision-making, how people, the invisible forces that shape that, and then how you can affect that. So I read like behavioral economists, like Dan Ariely, who wrote Predictably Irrational, or Chip and Dan Heath, who wrote Made to Stick. Um, uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, and now wrote a new book called Noise. And it's all around human decision-making. And anything by Cialdini is still pretty relevant. He wrote some of the initial books on persuasion, and now he wrote one called Presuasion. These are interesting books to understand the psychology of the sales conversation and how to help people make decisions. And the one who helps facilitate the decision gets more of them in their favor. The data is out there to prove that. The one who creates the buying vision versus the one who just shows up for the bake-off wins 74% of the time. 
you, you only have a one in four chance of showing up when that RFP or that bake off shows up, you're, you're, you're going to increase your odds to three and four. If you're the one who can create the buying vision and the way you do that is, is inspiring people to see the need to change. And then they naturally lean toward the one who helped them see that vision. A great point. So I want to wrap up here with two, two final questions. Um, and I ask all my podcast guests, these, these, these two questions. So first I'd like to know if you could go back, if you get in a time machine, go back, take Tim back 10, 15 years, what would you do different knowing what you know today? <laughs> uh, buy stock and Salesforce. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe everybody says that, but uh, um, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I look at sort of serendipity is not a bad thing. And I, I, I would I would say good thing I chose a journalism major right and, mm-hmm. and 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 really a good thing that I turned my attention to the psychology of decision making as opposed to just the process of selling it's really served well um, but what I would what I would say is uh, all those things aside is that if I um, spent more time understanding that uh, and I'm, I'm, this is my advice to folks that uh, too many companies force their prospects and customers to live in their story, the company story. And because we went down this whole path of what's your why and all this kind of stuff. And we write, we print t-shirts and put posters up and we make people like pledge allegiance to the flag of our company and the customers could care less because they live in their own story, their own experiences. And, And just knowing that that's the mindset I've got to get into the customer story to make myself and my stuff relevant, as opposed to leading with my company story, thinking people care. And uh, I wish I would have kind of got that even sooner. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, that, that pivot is, is, is now the norm. It is literally the only way you can function as a seller. Um, and uh, so I think that's important to, to, to think about. And uh, I wish I'd have known it sooner. Is what it kind of goes back. We I mean, I like to tell my students that it's not enough to know who your customers are. You need to know who your customers' customers are. Yeah, it's because they're looking at the outcomes that they're providing and how you can affect that dialogue, that that relationship between your customer and their customer. And it's it's uh, to me that that's a moment of truth that transcends anything your product does, right? Is, is how do you be relevant to that interaction? And that's awesome advice. Uh, keep giving that. I think that's perfect. So f- final question. So if my students or any other students who are listening to this podcast and they're sales students about to graduate, looking at a new professional sales career, give them some advice. What, what advice does Dr. Tim have for them? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, uh, uh, it's maybe too late to get that psychology minor but, uh, or that journalism uh, certificate, but uh, I would say lean into those things that, that uh, the way you're going to add value is, is, to, is to not just follow a process to a T. The way you're going to add value is to articulate value. And you need to be able to articulate value by understanding how people frame that value. So just understanding the science of decision-making is super important because that's what you do all day. You facilitate a choice. And I would, uh, I would just encourage people to extend their studies to those, those extra spaces and, and that will serve you well. And the second thing I would just say is uh, consider customer success to be a, commercial, a viable and a commercially representative career choice uh, because a lot of it is tilting in that direction. That's great sound advice. Um, thank you for that. So. So Tim, it was great having you on today. I um, very informative. I've I think I learned a little bit more uh, in this podcast than I than I learned when I listened to you in the Sales Educators Academy. So again, thank you. My and, pleasure. Uh, Thanks. Looking Craig. forward to diving into the book, and uh, maybe I'm done with this, and I can get the rest of your books because I think these will be really good things. Maybe I can add to the classroom. Well, we try to make them very practical uh, tips for how to have those conversations. So, uh, Greg, you, you you be my guest and and let me know. I would love to guest lecture sometime with you. So right. take care. Thanks for being on today, Tim. My pleasure. Thank you again for joining us on this episode of Talking Sales. 
of the LSU Professional Sales Institute podcast. If you would like to find out how you can recruit some outstanding sales talent from the LSU Professional Sales Institute, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can reach out. So first, I would recommend that you visit our website. It is lsu.edu forward slash business forward slash PSI. Or you can email me at g-a-c-c-a-r-d-o at lsu.edu. And another great way to communicate with me and to get a hold of me um, is on my LinkedIn page. I'm very active on LinkedIn, so I'm easy to find. That's Greg Accardo. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, it's a really exciting time in sales, as we all know. Uh, virtual is, is here to stay. Uh, maybe it may get diminished a little, but uh, guess what? Uh, virtual is going to be part of our new normal. So, And we're teaching our students currently how to maximize this virtual environment. So, again, my name is Greg Accardo, and you can find me on LinkedIn or at gacardo.com at lsu.edu. Thank you.